One of the areas which we typically spend a, a good deal of time with when we're in the middle of baptism counseling and also uh, in the area of premarital counseling is the, the subject of what is the person's prayer life, what is the couple's prayer life like uh, as, as they interact with God. And it's, it's interesting as I talk with uh, different individuals uh, who have, some many have been raised in the church, uh, some who have recently come into the truth, but the answers that I often get, depending on the, the couple that's about to be married or, or the, uh, the individual that's counseling for a baptism, when we, we talk openly about the person's prayer life, uh, is, is really all over the map. I've, I've heard all kinds of different uh, answers that people have given. Some have a very regular prayer life, pray very regularly, pray certain times of the day. It's, it's right there. Some really struggle with praying at all. Some have had ups and downs. Uh, it, it's, it's really all over the map. As, as we talk about baptism counseling, you know, and we, we think about that as, as, and I know we've got a, a variety of ministers in here that, that, that cover this, but we, we try to prepare the individual for the reality of entering into this covenant. They are about to enter into a covenant that is everlasting. It's a covenant that never ends. It's, it's a covenant with their maker, their creator, an agreement, a, a binding agreement with their father in heaven through the high priest and the, and the advocate, Jesus Christ, that they are uh, entering into through the laying on of hands, uh, the, spirit, the spirit comes into that individual and how does it enter? It enters by prayer. The, it's, it's a prayer that the, the minister, the, the elder, offers to God asking for that to occur uh, as the hands are laid upon them. Let's, uh, let's look at uh, 2 Chronicles 6 to begin. As, as we look at uh, Scripture, one of the things that, that struck me this week, well, actually the last couple of weeks, as, as I began to look at this topic, this topic of prayer, you know some amazing, miraculous things have happened in the Bible uh, as a result or in conjunction with prayer. When I say 2 Chronicles 6, uh, our Bible students uh, are, are ahead of me on this, but let's, let's read one of those uh, examples. 2 Chronicles 6, we'll actually start reading uh, here in a second in, in verse 12, but just before that, we, we, we're here at a time when Solomon and, and those working with him have completed the temple. They, they've completed it, it's ready, they're dedicating it to God. Uh, and, and it says here that as, as he is uh, about to, to do so, here in, in Second uh, Chronicles 6, the king turned around, verse 3, and blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was, sa was standing. And here's what King Solomon says in verse, verse 4. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has fulfilled with his hands what he spoke with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I've chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there, nor did I choose any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. Yet I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. We're working on a song right now in, in Sherman in the choir. It's uh, Jerusalem of Gold. And it's a, it's a beautiful piece as, as uh, we, we reflect upon God's uh, choosing of Jerusalem uh, to, to place uh, his name there through, through uh, the, being the capital of, of Israel, of, of, the, of the tribe of Israel, of, of all of the tribes where David reigned and then later to to build this house there and we understand and as we think about the song we think of how God views Jerusalem Mount Zion there in 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 that area and and where he's ultimately himself the father going to come down and dwell for all eternity after his son Jesus Christ 
has come down and dwelled there for a thousand years and through the great white throne judgment. But, uh, but thinking about all of that, let's come now to verse 12. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the, the eternal in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands, for Solomon had made a bronze platform five cubits long, five uh, cubits wide, three cubits high, and set it in the midst of the court, and he stood on it. And he knelt down on his knees before all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, Solomon begins to pray here. He said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven or on earth like you, one who keeps your covenant and your mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. We could spend much time on that verse. Does that verse typify your life with God? Does that verse typify how you and I are, are striving to walk with God, recognizing that God's keeping his covenant and being in a state of mercy with, with his servants, with, with you and me, as we walk before him with all our hearts? Verse 15, you've kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You've both spoken with your mouth and you've fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel, only if your sons take heed to their way, that they walk in my law as you have now walked, as you have walked before me. And now, O Lord God of Israel, let your word come true which you've spoken to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which we built, which I built. You know, he, he's keeping perspective as he's praying to God. Yes, we've done this. We've dedicated years to this, of putting this together, of, of making the highest quality building to, to your honor, God, but can this contain you? You are the God of the universe. You have made all of this happen. You are the one out of your mercy who has, has, has called us and walked with us and brought us to be this nation that we are now and to be your, your temple, to be your people here where this, this temple is, is, has been built. Verse 19, yet, yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be open toward this temple day and night, toward the place where you said you would put your name, that you may hear the prayer, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place, toward this place, and you may hear the supplications of your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. If anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an, uh, take an oath and, and comes and, and takes an oath before you, uh, your altar in this temple, then, then hear and, from heaven and act and judge your servants, bringing retribution on the wicked by bringing his way on his, on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. So Solomon continues uh, in this prayer, and I'll let you read that later, obviously. But let's look now at verse 40. So now he says that near the end of his prayer, now my God, I pray. He's continuing this pray on, prayer on his knees with his hands raised to heaven. Let your eyes be open and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place. And therefore arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in goodness. O oh Lord, do not turn your, uh, away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. And then we know the story. We know what happened next. After his prayer, after his uh, beseeching God and reaching out to him. Verse, verse 1, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Priests couldn't even enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Finally, verse 3, when all the children of Israel saw how fire came down in the glory of the eternal on the temple, they bowed their faces on the ground on the pavement and worshiped 
and praise the Lord, saying, He is good. His mercy endures forever. I think of that. I, I think of, as, as we've talked many times, what is going on in the, the latter part of Hebrews as, as we approach God at, from his throne, his actual throne, and, and reflect on that, that we can come into his presence. Let's go to another passage, Acts 4. Acts 4. So this was something that happened, uh, and, and a part of what happened was, was the prayer that Solomon gave. We have another situation where here Israel gets started. They're, they're, they're going, uh, Israel, spiritual Israel, as, as in the New, New Testament church. And Peter and John are called before these, uh, the various individuals that are accusing them of this and this and that. And they stand firm and, and support God in God's way and stand for that uh, through God's Holy Spirit and answered mightily, respectfully but mightily, in a defense of God's way of life, and Peter and John were, were, were let go. Look at what we see happening here just after that in Acts 4, verse 23. And being let go, Peter and John here, as, as we, it was talked about in verse 19, being let go, uh, they went to their own companions, those members of the church, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they all raised their voice to God with one accord. Uh, it says they raised their voice uh, to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You are the one who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, who is by the mouth of your servant David, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage? Well, all the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against Christ. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you appointed God, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, they were gathered together. Uh, but to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, in their prayer, they said, verse 29, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to, to your servants that with all boldness your servants may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, when they had finished that prayer, verse 31, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Both of these situations, early in, in the New Testament church and also at the dedication of the temple, came through prayer, came through a direct interaction with God. In one case, Solomon is, is speaking and giving a prayer on behalf of, of, of all Israel gathered there, and, and, and these individuals, wh whether it was one individual that was saying this as they did this with one accord, I, I seriously doubt that all of them had memorized those, those what, eight verses, and we all said this together. But it's, it's like as, as we pray at services, one individual is praying, and we are all with one accord thinking on that. Uh, as they did that with that one accord, look how God answered mightily. So in baptism, we, we talk about the whole concept of what it is to enter into this covenant and, and what the interaction needs to be like in, in interacting with God the Father and with God the Father interacting with the individual, this, this agreement, this relationship into which we enter. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, a person's prayer life is, is very important. We spend a lot of time with it in premarital counseling. Did that with... Uh, Tatiana and with Charlie in, in their marriage counseling, as, as I do with, with all couples with, with whom we counsel for marriage. Uh, one of the things we ask, what is your prayer life like? What is your prayer life like, Mr. Such and Such? And what is your prayer life like, Miss Such and Such, soon to be Mrs. Such and Such? Because you are about to enter into a covenant with God as a couple, as a unit, you are entering into this agreement, this bond with God that will last for eternity. I, I, I'm saying the bond, uh, not in terms of, of marriage between the husband and wife, but, but we, you are entering into a covenant with God, uh, a covenant of, of to be married till death do you part. Uh, but it is, it, it is also not just 
we are getting together and we are agreeing to do this. No, we are getting together and agreeing to do this before God and that God is a part of this agreement. So we, we, we talk about, well, you're, you're about to get married. You're going to be one flesh. How much time do you intend to spend with your wife as, uh, as you get married? How much time do you intend to spend with your wife to nurture or wife with husband to nurture and, and develop that relationship, that closeness, to, to grow to be more and more of one mind uh, as you also are of one flesh through the, through the marriage bond. How, how much time and dedication do you need that? Do you need a couple of minutes a day to just kind of talk? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, did you get the bills paid on that? Ooh, new electric, you didn't, get to, you didn't take care of electric. I thought you set that up on automatic bill pay. Oh, yep, got it, okay, great. All right, see you tomorrow. Uh, you know, is, is that how, is that, how that, that relationship is going to, to be bonded and strengthened? You know, there are, there are so many things that we deal with in today's society and so many challenges that we face in marriage uh, with, with the stresses, the, the job, the, the, the service to the church, service in other areas, our, our kids, our responsibilities. A couple can grow apart. And uh, I've, I've talked to you before about this. Lisa and I, uh, we, it wasn't a crisis in our marriage, but there was a point at which uh, we, we had moved to Oregon and I had gotten the new job uh, as a principal in this, in this small little school, which was completely out of my, my uh, comfort zone. And I was under a tremendous amount of stress just trying to, to understand what it was I was to do, let alone to, to try to learn how to do it and do it in such a way that uh, I don't get thrown out of the, the city or the state within a few weeks. So it was very stressful there. Lisa was pregnant and, uh, and not feeling well uh, the entire pregnancy. And we were in a place that did not have air conditioning. And the fellow that we were renting it from said he was just about to do that, but, and he just about got it done. Uh, and he got it done a year later. So it was, it was a long stress. So we were dealing with that. Uh, Stacy, our older uh, child at the time, was, was, was doing homeschooling, so Lisa was trying to homeschool her. All of these stresses that we were dealing with, my plate was full, Lisa's plate was full, our kid's uh, kid, uh, kid apostrophe S plate uh, was full, and, and it was, it, we, because of all that stress, we did not have the time that we needed to have with each other, the decompress time to connect. And, and, and it wasn't like we felt we were, we were losing, uh, you know, we were losing that closeness, but we realized it's, it's not there to the degree that, that it needs to be. And we, we began making some course corrections on that and, and began to heal that. But it took time. <laughs> it took time, spending time together, talking together, having a relaxing downtime together, doing things together, all of these kinds of things. And so many times it happens in, in marriage, we see this happening over and over. How many times do we see a family that you think everything's okay, but then the kids all grow up and they leave and then the husband and wife divorce. Uh, so, and then we get, begin to think, well, what, what was that? And obviously there can be a variety of different things, but one of the, one of the things that can happen is that the, the parents have become so focused on taking care of all of these things that they have to take care of and, and the demands on parenting and, and being there for the, the, the children that they lose that connection that they have for each other. They are, as we've talked many times, they are the central relationship in the family. It, it is the husband's and the wife's relationship. And some are able, when they've drifted that far away, some are able to begin to get that back some have gone so far that they're, they're unable to get that back. Who is this person that's in my house, this stranger, that now it's an empty nest and I'm, I'm supposed to interact with this person and we don't know each other anymore. We have different interests. We're, in different, we're going different directions. Uh, that can happen. I say that because coming back to the, the topic of today, with, with the marriage covenant that they're entering into, that covenant also involves God. God is, is just as much a part of that covenant as, as the husband and wife are. It's, in a sense, a, a three-way covenant. And, and there is a critical need for the husband and wife to, 
to develop that close relationship with God and maintain that close relationship of, with God in order to, to, to have a blessed marriage, but in order to keep everything in perspective. So I would ask all of us to, to think about that. Where, where are you right now? Where, where is your marriage relationship with respect to the closeness with, with you as husband and wife, those of us here who are married? What part does God play in that? What part does God play in that, that covenant? What portion of your relationship as husband and wife will be devoted or is devoted to the third being, <laughs> the third being in this God plane relationship? Those of us who have attended a marriage ceremony in the church, remember these. These will, will uh, strike a chord. But, but think about this with respect to our relationship with God. Think about this with respect to uh, our prayer life. Within the church, it is God, not, the law, not man or the laws of man, who joins together husband and wife as one flesh. Tomorrow, it's God. God, the Father, the Creator, the one who sits in the third heaven with all of the angels about him and all the brilliant splendor of his glorious throne, tomorrow God is going to unite those two. Not, not merely the laws of man. God, the Father, is going to unite those two as husband and wife. In Ephesians 5.21, Paul talks about submitting to one another in the fear of God. The sacred marriage covenant calls upon you to yield yourselves to God and to each other. How do we yield ourselves to God? Partly through prayer. To the husbands, Peter wrote, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, for what reason? That your prayers be not hindered. Uh, in, 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 in Peter's letter here, he's, he's stressing the importance of, of all of this. He's leading up of, of dwelling with our wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife, this understanding that's going there, thinking about the grace of life. And what's he leading it to? So that our prayers are not in, hindered. It's such a critical component uh, that we, in marriage, even in a sense, if I can, if I can stretch, this, stretch this out to, to, to grasp this, the the marriage relationship is, in a, in a sense, what he's saying here is it's, it's, it's subordinate to the relationship with God. The, the, we don't want anything here to affect this because this is the most critical point of anything, is, is that our prayers are not hindered, that we're able to have this direct relationship with God and God with us. So we dwell with our wives with understanding not that my wife is everything. What is everything is my relationship with God. And, and through that relationship with God, that when that is right, uh, because I want that so much to be right and be right with God and, 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 and pleasing to him, I am going to strive to dwell with my wife with understanding uh, and giving honor to her because I don't want my prayers to be hindered. The next statement, we see that a loving relationship within marriage is a type of the spiritual relationship between God and the church. And it is in your submission, we say, as we'll say to Charlie and Tatiana tomorrow, it is in your submission to God's love that this marriage will be strengthened and protected. To the degree that they are not submissive to God's love is the degree to which it will not be strengthened and protected. That's a reality. And we see that play out. Uh, in, in marriages uh, in the church sometimes when, when there are problems. Because marriage is a divine institution and we're asking God in prayer, it's what we're about to do, we're asking God in prayer to unite you as husband and wife, it is fitting that each of you should faithfully promise before God to accept this sacred marriage covenant according to the divinely ordained conditions established by the Almighty God. And then lastly, what do we say at the end? Uh, you may kiss the bride. Yes, we do say that. But we say something just before that. Since all ordination or setting apart in the scriptures is by the laying on of hands, would you please join your right hands? And with the laying on of my hands, the minister says, I will ask the eternal God to unite you as husband and wife. And then what do we do? We pray. We pray. And we pray 
to God the Father and as the, the minister, and tomorrow it will be Mr. Joe Meeker, unless he gets emotionally distraught and asks me to step in or someone else, which I think Mr. Meeker will, will handle it okay. I'm pretty confident. But anyway, he, 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 will, he will ask God to unite them as husband and wife. And we, uh, those who are there at, at, at that service, will be in one accord uh, with, with Mr. Meeker as he prays, asking for God to do that. How would you describe your prayer life? How often do you and I pray each day? How intentional are we as we pray to God? Do we pray daily? When do we pray? At what times of day do we pray? How long do you and I pray? Are you really, really regular in your prayer life? Well, I'm on it. I'm on it, and you pray two and a half minutes a day. But I'm on it. I am on it like a rash. Boy, I'm there. Boom, I'm on it, and I get that done. But I pray one and a half to 1.75 minutes a day. But I'm, I'm faithful in it. Uh, what, what is your prayer life like? What is the nature of your interaction with your spiritual father in heaven? What is mine? How does it flow? How does the, the dialogue flow as, as we interact with God through prayer? What do we discuss? What do we pray about with God? Would you characterize your prayer life as vibrant, stale, or non-existent? If it's in the non-existent phase, that's not a good thing. Okay, we're not going to talk about that today, but we're, we are going to talk about this, and this is the title of the message. Your prayer life, vibrant or stale? Where, where would you uh, place your prayer life at this time? Would you, would you say that your interaction with God is, is one that is in prayer, is one that is vibrant, that, that you are actively engaged in prayer, or, or does it at times take on a stale nature? And uh, do, you, do you battle that at times? I want to talk about that today. And actually, uh, as we got into it, I realized it's a, it's a two-parter. So we'll quit when it's time to quit and, and cover the next portion uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, David, Daniel, and, and Jesus Christ, we know from the Bible, prayed regularly to God the Father. Daniel and, and David, three times a day, uh, was their, their custom to pray before God. Uh, I won't turn there. I'll read some of the passages. Uh, Matthew 14, uh, speaking of, of Christ himself, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and it was evening, and he was there alone. Jesus Christ, the one who existed with God eternally as he was born of flesh and, and was a human being uh, subject to the, the situations that a human being deals with, uh, being uh, a man uh, had to stay close to God. And Jesus Christ went alone and prayed to God. Did he do it for show? Did he do it to just simply try to set an example? Or did he do it because he really wanted to maintain a very, very close connected relationship with his father for the right reasons? Luke 9, 18, and it happened while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. Uh, and he, he questioned them at that time, who do the people say that I am? After bidding them farewell, Mark 6, 46, he left for the mountain to pray. Mark 1, 35, early in the morning, when it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Luke 5, 16, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Luke 9, 18, and it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Again, uh, the same passage. Oh, I, I wrote that twice. Sorry. Uh, but a basic question that we need to ask at this point that we need to address before we get into the, the subject itself is, is one that I, I think it's, a, as I started thinking about this, I thought, I, I need to answer this question. It's, it's basic, but I need to answer. We all need to answer this question. Why must we pray? Why must we pray? Why must we pray to God? Why is that required of God's people? Do you think that you must pray in order to become a part of God's family for eternity? Do you think that is a requirement? Is that really necessary? I'll answer that very quickly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
If you want to be a part of the family of God, if I want to be a part of the family of God for eternity, I've got to be praying to God. I've got to be connected to him. I've got to have a relationship with him. And, and that is because that's part of the process of, of our communicating and developing this relationship. It is critical. Why must we pray? So let's look at a few of these really quickly. I'll go through them quickly. There, there are many more. But in a sense, the benefits of prayer. What, what are the benefits of prayer? I think we need to answer that because it, it helps drive us in the right direction to stay connected with God. And I, I believe it also helps the vibrancy or the, the, the dynamic, the, the dynamism of, of the interaction with God in prayer. One is because Jesus Christ did. We just read that. We, we are to be like Christ. Jesus Christ prayed to God. He prayed to God often. Uh, and, and the disciples saw that, and they, they asked him how they should pray. So one of the reasons why we pray is because that's what Jesus Christ did, and he, he set the example for us. Secondly, uh, it is the medium through which we have fellowship with God and through which we develop the relationship, the bond, the connection, and the love towards God. We cannot do that without praying to him. We cannot do that without interacting. It is the medium you know, it is the mode of, of communication that God put forth that's stating this is how we do this. There's no other way around that. It, it, is, it is through that. That is one of the mediums. Thirdly, prayer is designed as a tool that God gives us to enable us to recognize his sovereignty over everything. Prayer, by praying, we, we are able to to think about a being whom we cannot see and, and, and interact with him and yet see that this being runs everything. He is in charge of everything. He loves all of mankind so much that he gave his son. He has a plan in place. He, he, is, he is the one that sustains everything that is around us. And it, it helps us keep that in perspective. <laughs> When we don't pray, we begin to lose that somehow. I, I've seen it in, in others' lives. I, I've seen other things crowd into their minds. But when, when we are constantly in prayer and connected with God, we recognize that sovereignty that's there. And that's where God wants us to be because he's on a power trip or, or some kind of a vanity trip. Well, of course not. He is the perfect God of love. And he wants us to connect with him in every way because he knows that's, that's good for us. Let's go to Colossians 4. A, 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 a fourth thing that uh, to some degree ties in with the third point of, of to help us recognize God's sovereignty uh, is, is discussed to some degree here in, in Colossians 4. That point is this. Prayer helps us. It, it causes us. In some ways, it forces us to take a step back to, throughout the day, if, if we pray several times a day, I know there, there are many that pray regularly, but they, they really only have time to pray once a day or they, they can only make time uh, once a day. I, I would encourage all of us to, to strive to create and find as many times in the day that we can, as, as, as it talks about Christ, all of a sudden he, he goes over here. He, as was his custom, he, he went over here and prayed. He often would go up here and pray. But to, to creatively think about times when we can get away because we want to have a relationship with him, with God, and in, 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 since through Christ, uh, we, we want and desire that so much as, as we do with our mate. But, but uh, he, to, to foster that relationship. Prayer helps us take a step back throughout the day to gain to regain, or, or sometimes it's maybe just to maintain uh, perspective about what really matters in life. One of the things that it, it's interesting watching individuals that are really going through stresses at different times, sometimes that's when the prayer life begins to diminish. Uh, and, and as a result, you, you can, as we talk with them, you, you see that the, that perspective is out of whack. Uh, there's, there's so much stress in this and this and this and this that uh, they, they feel like I don't even have time to pray. I can't even think. I've got so many things 
things going on and so many stresses, as soon as I just have any little bit of downtime, my mind goes to this stress or I'm so exhausted that as soon as I get my free time, I'm, I'm out. Uh, but but to, to create uh, an opportunity to step back, to get rid of the electronic devices, to put them on silent and, and get away and step back and, and interact with God, that it helps us keep that perspective. Otherwise, we lose it. We lose it. We drift. We drift from it. Uh, let's look at, uh, I, again, I mentioned here Colossians 4. Colossians 4, verse 2. He says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Philippians 4 talks about uh, as we make our requests known to God, we always do it in thanksgiving. It's always in the, the whole uh, under the umbrella of being thankful. We'll talk about that in a second. But he says, continue earnestly in prayer. There's an earnestness about it, a, a vigilance in it, a, a drive to make sure that that is happening, a desire to interact with God in that. Do, doing this kind of thing takes time. Being vigilant <laughs> involves time uh, that we must set aside. Uh, two more points with why we must pray. The fifth one is this, and we just, we just talked about that. Prayer is the vehicle that God gives us to allow us to express our thankfulness to him. Without, without prayer, we are unable to, to communicate with God or, or to share with God or demonstrate to God our thankfulness to him. You ever think about it that way? But We've got to pray to be able to, to be thankful to the one who makes these things possible. We've talked about this, this subject before, but uh, I, I fully believe this. I've seen it in people's lives, and I think we've, we've seen this in others' lives, that we cannot experience true, lasting happiness in the absence of gratitude. We just can't do it. You just, we just can't truly be happy if there are elements of our lives that, that ingratitude seeps in. We, we, we always must be in a state of gratitude. Being able to pray always with the, the umbrella of thanksgiving uh, covering that entire prayer uh, allows us to experience happiness. The, the person who is generally unhappy, I will submit to you, you know, obviously there are, there are issues sometimes of mental uh, difficulties and challenges that, that people face, sometimes chemical imbalances in, in those areas. I don't want to uh, minimize that. Those, those are real issues, and, and they are issues that, that need our attention in that. But, but if those are not a factor, uh, if, if there is an element of, of unhappiness in your life, or I'm, not that we won't have ups and downs in life and times where we're happy and, 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 when, and when we're sad, but a general tenor of unhappiness in our lives, I will submit to you that there is some form of ingratitude that's there, some form of ingratitude that is we've allowed to take root. A final point with this, let's go to First uh, Thessalonians 5 as, as a reason why we must pray. I'm going to read verses 12 through 28, and, and I would like, if, if you could, uh, to try to try to think as Paul is talking here and, and hitting all these different points, try to uh, uh, bring it down to, to one concept. What is, what is Paul wanting us to do? Is, is there a word that that he's trying to get at, that an approach to life that we should have. I'll, I'll read it and, and, and think about this. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. He says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14. Now we encourage you, we exhort you, uh, Light a fire uh, under you, so to speak. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but pursue what is good, 
both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Always be in a state of, of, of that where you're in contact with God. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Test all things. You know, look at things. Examine things. Discern all of those kinds of things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Stay away from it. Now may the God of peace himself set you apart completely, sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body, your, your whole essence of who you are, every part, facet of your being, be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and who will also do it. And brethren, pray for us. And then he sends his, his final greetings. You know, when I think of all of the things that he's saying there, one thing that, that hits me, that, that jumps out is, what, what is Paul saying to do there? I see the term vigilance. Be vigilant, he's saying. Be vigilant about every aspect of our lives. And, and part of that vigilance really comes through in this thing, as we see in verses 17 and 18, of praying without ceasing, uh, in everything giving thanks, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus uh, for you. You know, I, I've talked with you uh, about this before, but I, I, always, I always come back to the, the whole steering wheel analogy. I think I've told you this story, but I really like it, so I've got to say it again. I just make my apologies up front. Okay. Uh, I, I've told you that Stacy never learned to ride a bike, and then my oldest, uh, and very uh, upset with myself for that as a, PE instructor not teaching my own daughter how to ride a bike but uh, to this day as I've mentioned before she still does not know how to ride a bike but she she has some very redeeming qualities uh, in her life other than that but I try not to let that every time I see her there's my daughter who cannot ride a bike no I don't, I don't do that I, I love my daughter she's she's an incredible individual but but anyway Stacy never learned to ride a bike and all of us know with, with bike riding, when you learn to ride a bike, one of the first things you know that say you're going down a hill at 20 miles per hour, if you want to go to the right, all you do is just take the, the, the handlebars and turn them really sharply, and it works very well. Uh, and it's the same with a car. Uh, if you're going about 70 to 71 or two miles per hour, you're driving down the, the freeway, and uh, you start to drift a little bit over, one of the best things to do is just take that wheel and turn it like a hard 90 degrees, and you're where you need to be immediately. Uh, because because Stacy never learned to ride a bike when she started driving, that was uh, that was something with which she struggled. It was uh, it was a growth opportunity for her. I'll put it that way. But so on on the other hand, uh, again, I'm comparing my daughters uh, of all things. But but Christy Christy got one of those little scooters those the, you know you put your feet on and you got to push with your foot foot and it's those little tiny plastic wheels rubber plastic kind of wheels that don't handle bumps really well but they help you really learn to balance well and she she started with that and then when she switched over to a bike boy she just took to it immediately because she already knew balancing and and knew how to uh, course correct very 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 easily and, and quickly uh, Stacy now, my oldest, is, is, a, is a very good driver, by the way, but, uh, but it, was, it was something that was difficult for her because it was so new to her. It wasn't a part of her, of her life. With, with the spiritual elements of life, think about that concept. Here we are. If we are praying without ceasing and, and we are so vigilant in these areas, and we're, so spiritually we're going down 75 on, on the freeway, and things are happening all around us, but when we're in, in that lane, you know, we've got, we've got a little bit of space on each side of, of where it's bad news if we get off uh, to that. But how many of us are constantly thinking, oh, I've drifted over this far, I've got to turn it back this way. I've drifted over this far, I've got to turn it back this way. We don't, we don't actually, most of us, I would think, don't, don't actually even think about it. It, it, is a, it is a sense that we have that we're just naturally making these little little course corrections. It's, it's so much a part of our lives to know what that is and to live that way of staying between those two lines that we're automatically course correcting. And, and that's, that's the way 
That's the way God intends our spiritual lives to be, to, to be so in tune with him that when we start to just barely drift, it's automatically a, I, I just looked at that. What, what was I doing looking at that? I shouldn't look at that. That's not right. Course correction. Uh, I just had this thought about this situation, and this, it was a selfish thought. What am, I, what am I doing thinking about that? That's not right. But he, he wants that. that. That's the praying without ceasing. I'm constantly striving to think about God and his ways. It's always there so that whenever I drift a little, there's a, a, an immediate course correction. That is the examining ourselves. That, that is the, the direction God wants us to, to go to. Now, occasionally, do we, do we come up against things where we are broadsided or, or blindsided by something that we never saw in our lives? Well, of course we are. And, and God helps us through that as well. But, but the praying without ceasing, the being in contact with God our Father, uh, to the degree that we're always thinking about those kinds of things, is what keeps us on the straight and narrow, isn't it? And, and when we don't do that, that's when, that's when we get into some of these, these areas that can really, really, really cause uh, huge, huge consequences. Every sin is worthy of eternal death. We know that. Every sin uh, must be covered by the shed blood of Christ. But, but there is a difference between a person who is in a state of striving to be lawful, striving to have the law of God written in his or her heart, and constantly being in prayer with God and thinking of God's way of life versus a person who is in a state of lawlessness. And when we, we get into that state of lawlessness, either through active decisions or through inaction, uh, it's, it's very dangerous. And, and that's when what happens, oh, I need to course correct, you know, over into the other day, course correct. And we get into that mode. Uh, God wants us in this mode. Get it, got it good? We understand that? That very, very critical point of, of, of our spiritual lives. We grow as we spend time in proximity with our Father. We grow as we learn from our teacher. Okay, so with that, let's, uh, let's uh, take a change now, uh, change things up a bit, and let's go to Matthew 6. Luke, uh, Luke 11 talks about this and, and, and also Matthew 6. Matthew 6, uh, Matthew's account gives a, a bit more details to this outline prayer. So I'd like to talk about a couple of things before we get into that. And, and as I mentioned, we'll go through uh, some components of this uh, today, and we'll finish up uh, two weeks from today. But I'd like to start with, with what uh, we, we could call uh, are the do not do this directives of prayer. The do not do this directives of prayer. Uh, William Barclay uh, has a commentary, a daily uh, study Bible series, and uh, Mr. Barclay's material, sometimes I find you know, very helpful in terms of the background of certain things. Sometimes uh, I, I, he is way off <laughs> in terms of doctrine, but, uh, but I found it to be a, a good series sometimes to, to round out and help me understand some of the background uh, of, of reading, as, w as which many resources are. We always have to be careful, uh, but, but I think in, in this respect, there are some things that, that, that Barclay uh, draws analogies to that, or, or actually draws references to, to the time of day that Christ, in which Christ lived that, that uh, speak to what we're going to cover. So let's go to Matthew 6, verse 5. Matthew 6, verse 5, we know uh, this passage is it deals with the, the outline prayer, and we've, we've covered an aspect of this recently in talking about uh, they have their reward. Matthew 6, verse 5, and when you pray, he says, okay, so there is a win there, not a, and if you decide to pray. So we must remember that. But, and when you pray, don't, don't be like the, you shall not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, as we covered a couple times ago, they, they have their reward. They, they get their reward from folks who think, wow, that person's incredible. Wow, incredible prayer. Verse 6. But when, but you, you and I, when, when, when we pray, he says, go into your room, and when you've shut your door, pray to your Father who's in secret, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, 
not if, but when, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. But in this manner, therefore, is how you should pray. Barclay mentions, actually, I, I, I saw a couple of things here, but Barclay mentioned seven do not do's that, that he got from this. And I thought, wow, where, where, did, where did you get this? And then as I began looking at it, I, I, I saw uh, what he was getting at. One of, and part of that is, is in the history of, of the, the religion uh, in that community at that time. I'm going to read from page 192 of, of, his, of his book as it covers this subject. The first thing he said is prayer had become so formalized that it lacked meaning. It was so formal, we did this and we do this, that it lacked a meaning. It had lacked a vibrancy, I think we could say. Uh, page 192, he says, uh, There were two things the daily use of which was prescribed for every Jew. The first was the Shema, you know, the Deuteronomy 6 thing of uh, the Lord our God, uh, he is one, uh, one Lord. And then they go through and talk about the, uh, the way that we're to teach uh, our, our, our younger people as we walk by the way and all that. That was part of the Shema, verses 4 through 9, 11, uh, 13 through 21. And then also, uh, the, the first was the Shema, which consists of three short, short passages of Scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, 11, 13 through 21, and then Numbers uh, 15, 37 through 41. Shema is the imperative of the Hebrew word to hear, and the Shema takes its name from the verse which was the essence and center of the whole matter. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh, the full Shema had to be recited by every Jew every morning and every evening. It, it had to be said as early as possible. It had to be said as soon as the light was strong enough to enable a man to distinguish between blue and white. As Rabbi Eliezer said, between blue and green. In any event, it had to be said before the third hour, that is 9 a.m., and in the evening, it had to be said before 9 p.m. If the last possible moment for the saying of the Shema had come, no matter where a man found himself, at home, in the street, at work, in the synagogue, he must stop and say it. And then he went on to say that there were many who loved the Shema and who repeated it with reverence and adoration and love, but inevitably there were still more who gabbled their way through it and went their way. The Shema had every chance of becoming a vain repetition, which men mumbled through like some spell or incantation. Incantation, And then he goes on to say how uh, it's, it's, it can be that way in Christianity. And I, I think of, well, how is it for us? We, we pray before we eat every meal. How is it at the dinner table? Is it in a sense like a Shema? Do I have my, my phrase that I say every time? Do I... Uh, you know, just have my, my quick thing that we say, yeah, we need to give God thanks. Uh, thanks for this food. We appreciate it. It comes from you. Uh, thank you for, for uh, please bless it for our nourishment. Please bless our fellowship. And then boom, we're right into the food. Is, is it something that I get out of the way for that purpose or, or does it have meaning? We can have many things in our prayers. It can be that way in our regular prayer life that, well, I've got to take care of this. So I'm going to go through and, and, and get these. And it can become uh, so formalized uh, or, or move into the area of, of a vain repetition. He also talks about what's called, the, I believe, the Shimon, Shimone Ezra. Shimone Ezra, which means the 18. It consisted of 18 prayers and was and, and still is an essential part of the synagogue service. In time, the prayers became 19, but the old name remains. Most of these prayers are quite short, and nearly all of them, Barclay says, are very lovely. I'll read one of them. This is the fifth. Bring us back to thy law, O Lord. I'm sorry. Bring us back to thy law, O our Father. Bring us back, O King, to thy service. Bring us back to thee by true repentance. Praised be thou, O Lord, who dost accept our repentance. He says, no church possesses a more beautiful liturgy than the Shimonai Ezra. Uh, so, but the law was that the Jew must recite it three times a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once in the evening. And the same, the same thing happened again. The devout Jew prayed it with loving devotion. 
uh, but many uh, just, again, gabbled their way through it. Uh, any, any kind of, of thing that moves into a vain repetition, uh, they had uh, situations there that the heathens did that, that got into this vain repetition. If, if we say these things, if we say this over and over and over again, God, uh, our gods will intervene. Uh, think about how the, the, the crowd got louder and louder and for several hours there in the book of Acts continued chanting the same thing over and over again. What did the, what did the, the prophets of Baal do when they were dealing with Elijah? They were saying it over and over and over again that you know, God would finally hopefully hear them, that their, God would fi their gods would finally hear them. The Jews had set times for prayers, and not, not that it's, it's inappropriate to have set times for prayers, but it can become so routine that it, it lacks the connection factor of what we're really striving to do. Another thing he said that uh, wasn't necessarily uh, talked about here, I guess, you know, to some degree, maybe with the, with the synagogues, but uh, the Jews often, there was a tendency to connect prayer with certain places, that if we are here and praying in this situation, in, in these physical surroundings, it had extra meaning. We understand, of course, that we, we come before the great God of his throne. Uh, there were, was a tendency towards long prayers. And he says, don't, don't get into that mode of praying uh, to be heard. The, the, the longer and the more elaborate and, and beautifully uh, described uh, and flowing type of prayer that I have, God will hear that because, wow, that was beautifully poetic. Uh, is that what it's about? No, it's not that at all. Uh, Barclay makes several uh, comments about that. And then, of course, praying to be seen of men. These, these are all do not do's. I want to address the, the one passage, uh, the one concept here of uh, they think they'll be heard for their, their many words. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 5. This is a question that arises from time to time, and uh, I think in trying to process this, uh, sometimes we can uh, struggle with what, what is God really wanting here. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1 Solomon's saying here, you know, walk prudently when you go to the house of God. Well, where's the house of God now? Well, the house of God, obviously, is we come before God uh, to, to pray to him. He is in his house, his tabernacle, which is, which is in the heavens. So as we come before his throne, he says, walk prudently when we do this. Draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God's in heaven, and you on earth. Like, remember that. He says, remember that. When we go before God, he is not here. He is, he is there in heaven. He is at the throne of overseeing the entire universe. This is an incredible, powerful being who is in control of all things. Uh, that's, that's what we're doing, uh, and, and we are human, and we are here on earth. He says, therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by as many words. But when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you've owed. Better not to vow than to vow and not follow through with it and pay. Verse 6, don't let your mouth cause your flesh to sin nor say before the messenger of God that it was, oh, it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there is also vanity, but, but fear God. You know, some, some will, will, will look at that sometimes and think, well, okay, so, so that means I really shouldn't say much. I need to really keep it to a brief minimum as I come before God. We've talked about this before, but... Uh, what about those of us in the audience, and I, I want to get a hand raise again because I didn't get a chance to look at all of your faces a couple of years ago when we did this, but how many of you, as you're trying to figure out what 
you need to do in the next course of action, uh, tend to talk to, to think it through. You have to talk it out to get to that decision that you need to make. How many of you are those kinds of people? There's Emily. Did you, we've, we've just got a mass of people, not David Everman though. He's pondering with his pen in his mouth and thinking. Uh, anyway, so, so I, let me see that again. I just want to look at a few other people. How many of you are talkers to think? Some of you whom I know well, I would say, yes, you, you, have, you have chosen wisely. That's what you are. Uh, how many of you think about what you need to say and, and don't say it until you've thought about it? How many of you think you know this is the way you operate? Okay, again, which one, look, look at those, which, which one tends to get us in more trouble? Okay, it's a pretty, pretty easy answer, right? Pretty easy, uh, those of us, because I'm in that first category, and I'm aware of that. Uh, the, some of us tend to be a stream of consciousness kind of person. Uh, and uh, so... Think about that as, as you are in a personal relationship with God to, to work through things, you need to, you need to talk with him to think. Uh, those of us who, who, who don't need, need to think and think and think, and then we go to God with that. Uh, is, is either one of those wrong? Is either one of those a wrong approach? No, because you are who you are. It is not a sin to talk to think. It is not a sin to think and think and think before you talk. Uh, it, is a, it is dangerous if we are rash with our mouths. If we say, okay, this is just the way I am. I, I've got to just flow and I've got to let it all come out. And I know some of it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be nice. And I'm, I'm going to have to apologize later. But I can't work this out unless I just... Blah, 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 and then we deal with it. That, that gets to where we are being rash with our mouth. Uh, that's not the way God says to do it. How be it? Uh, how be it? Is that the word? Uh, although, uh, to, to say, I need to talk through this to get to that, nothing wrong with that. But, but remember, those of us that are in that first category, we've got to be very careful about that because we can begin to move into being rash with my mouth and talking to think to the point that we are sinning with our mouth. Uh, or we are uttering something hastily before, before God. He's saying, hey, listen, you, you're coming before this great being here, and he listens to what you say, and it is very important what we say. So we are, not that, not that we don't talk openly with him, but we've got to be, we also have to be very uh, mindful of that. So does that mean that we are to only be in a situation where we've got the situation of the Pharisee and, and the person that's there, praying and you know, they say that the, the sinner is over there and he's, he's, he's beating on his chest saying, forgive me God, uh, a sinner. I don't remember the exact phrase, but I, this is what I am. And that's about all he said. And then the Pharisees over here, I thank you God that I am not like this person and very eloquently saying all this. So does that mean that the best way to pray to God is to say this one sentence, I am a sinner and that's it. You know, it, it he's not meaning that. He, he's meaning that our interactions with God must be heartfelt, must be, must be real, and, and we are to talk with God, but we are also recognizing the being with, with whom we are, we are coming before to talk. Be, be careful in that. Be careful in that as we are uh, to be careful in, in all ways. So uh, in, in that construct then, uh, let's, let's come back to this situation of, well, it's better uh, to keep our words few. Therefore, let your words be few. So basically, if I can keep the prayer in the one and a half to 1.75 minute range, I am fulfilling scripture. I am keeping my words few before God. Is that what he's saying? Uh, again, we come back to the example of our Savior. Let's go to Luke 6. Let's go to Luke 6.
Luke 6, verse 12. Luke 6, verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he, who's the he here? It's Jesus Christ, that he went out to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. Well, he really only said one word every 27 minutes. And as a result, uh, he spoke his very, obviously that's not the case. Jesus Christ poured his, ho- his heart out to God and, and talked with God in prayer all night. Was Jesus Christ careful in, in, in the way that he uh, addressed his, his creator? And was he sinless in every way? Yes. So obviously it's not that our words uh, need to always be few as we interact with God. It would be difficult to pray to God all night with saying very few words. We understand that, right? Okay, we're going to stop here. And uh, next, next time we're going to cover uh, three, three keys or three elements to, to helping our prayer life experience a vibrancy uh, and, uh, and, and meaning that uh, builds that relationship with God. Uh, in the meantime, I, I, I would ask us, uh, as we prepare for that next, next message, is to, 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 again, take stock in, in where our prayer life is. Take stock in the importance of it, and, and take stock in, in our desire to, to want to continue to build this closeness and this relationship uh, with God uh, due to this, this great being that he is and our desire uh, to be like him in every way. We'll see you next time.